Luke, the 13th chapter, reading verses 22 through verse 30. And the King James text today reads, And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not, whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first. And there are first which shall be last. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me a moment? Master, today, O oh God, we so appreciate the anointing, the presence, the power of God that we feel in the house of the Lord today. Oh, to be reminded, we shall see the King. We shall see the King. We shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in power. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, what a joyful thought for the believer. There is no fear. There is no trepidation. There is no concern, no anxiety, only joy when we contemplate the return, the appearance of our King. Master, the Word of God is now broken open. The preacher is poised and ready to deliver the Word that you've given me for this hour and as always, always, always. I ask God that you would anoint the messenger Anoint the message, anoint the ears of every hearer that our hearts and minds might at this very moment be prepared by the Holy Ghost to receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. Let me be naught but your mouthpiece today, O God. He must increase, I must decrease. Let the message be far more important today, Lord, than the messenger. For we ask it in none other than Jesus. Wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Most evangelical Christians represent the gospel of Jesus Christ as a matter of one's knowing God. They will often ask, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Mm -hmm. The problem with this theology is that it is lopsided. They place all the emphasis and all the responsibility on the believer. We must study, we must learn, we must grow closer to God. But the truth of the matter today is there will be far more people lost throughout eternity who knew Jesus 
listen to me now, then there will be people who were known by Jesus. People love to name drop in the society in which we live today. There's nothing makes folks feel more important, feel more special than being able to claim a relationship with someone powerful or someone famous, someone well known, a chance meeting on a busy sidewalk in a major city can seem to appear as a deep and meaningful relationship if it's presented properly. While living in New York City for the decade of the 90s, I've mentioned before, I had the opportunity to briefly and casually meet many celebrities. I met such famous uh, movie and television uh, figures as Harvey Firestein of Torch Song Trilogy fame and Independence Day. Everybody knows Queen Latifah. I've held the door for Queen Latifah. Didn't even know who I was holding the door for. The man at the bodega told me afterward, do you know who you just held the door for? I said, no. He said, that's Queen Latifah. I said, uh, she grew up in this area. I was working in real estate at the time. As I, I have a license in New York uh, State to sell real estate. I did that in New York City. And uh, he said, she grew up in the area, and every time she comes into town, you know, she always comes in and says hello. She's so sweet, you know, blah, blah, blah. And here I was holding the door, didn't even know who she was. Had the opportunity to hold the door on several occasions for Susan Sarandon, a very well-known television and movie actress. Matthew Broderick of Ferris Bueller's Day Off and War Games fame. He and I had an encounter on a street in the West Village. Knocked him straight flat on his rear end, not paying attention to where I was going. Knocked him on his backside, bless his heart. Then as I went to help him up, he's looking at me like I just murdered his children. I couldn't figure out why he was looking at me this way. And I'm looking at him and probably because of the dumbfounded, idiotic look I had on my face. I'm looking at him like, don't I know you? Don't. I, I recognized him immediately, but for the life of me, you know, I couldn't put two and two together. Kind of helped him up and he didn't say two words and he kind of run off. And I'm looking after him as he left, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh my Lord, that was Matthew Broderick. I know his wife and family lived down in the West uh, Village area. I'd heard that. He does a lot of work on Broadway. Nathan Lane of the Birdcage, and now, of course, he's on uh, Modern Family. Had the chance to meet him, hugged his neck, told him how much I loved him and loved his work. He looked at me like I was a murderer and a rapist. And, you know, I guess he wasn't accustomed to some big old stupid guy just grabbing hold of him and hugging him and loving on him. You know, I, I, it was just impulsive. Hume Cronin from Batteries Not Included and Cocoon. Kathy Najimy made famous by her little portly laughing nun on uh, Sister Act. Danny B uh, Bonaducci of Partridge family fame. Got to tell you, now Danny I probably spoke to more. I actually bumped into him two or three different times. And we talked each time. One of the sweetest, God is my eternal witness, one of the sweetest people I've ever met. Every time I see the trouble he's had in his life, it hurts my spirit because there's something about him that is so precious in his spirit, I can't even explain it. He would sit and talk to this old gay boy and just be as friendly and as personable and as kind and as, as any human being could possibly be. 
Jane Connell was one of my favorites. She played the character Agnes Gooch in the musical Maine with Lucille Ball. I had the opportunity to visit with her twice. Once when I went for a uh, audition in New York City. Yes, I dabbled in acting a little bit and stuff. And I went to audition, funny enough, for a production of Maine. And at the rehearsal space where they were auditioning for this, uh, she happened to be there that day. And uh, I got to talk to her, and I just gushed like some kind of a lunatic, you know, because Maine and Auntie Maine, the non-musical version, those are two of my favorite films of all time. I love the story of Maine, and I love the play, and, you know, and the musical version I loved. And so I got to talk with her there, and then later I was working at... Uh, Macy's on Herald Square, the flagship store, over there on 34th Street. She came in. I was working for Ralph Lauren Bedding there in, May, in, uh, in uh, Macy's. And she came in to buy some things, and I got to wait on her and talk to her some more. Yeah, I met some interesting people. Gavin McLeod, the captain from the television series The Love Boat. He was there the same day I met uh, Agnes Gooch, you know, Miss Connell, when I went for that uh, play. I've met all these famous people briefly, some more briefly than others, spoke to several of them. Some of them I spoke to for quite a while. I spoke to Hume Cronin for quite a long time. He was an extremely kind and chatty gentleman. Told him how much I loved his wife, who had since passed away, and uh, how much I loved her work, and how much I loved her, and... And boy, I mean to tell you, that man loved his wife. You, <laughs> you didn't have to tell. It, it wasn't hard to tell he loved his wife. Because he just gushed about her. He just gushed and gushed about her. I think it thrilled him to death that I brought her name up, you know. But you know what? For all my encounters with the rich and famous, as it were, if I were to suggest that I knew any of these people, it would be foolishness and it would be folly. I can scarcely imagine today that any one of these celebrities would even for a moment remember their brief encounter with me. <laughs> I remember my encounter with them because they were somebody special. They were somebody famous. They were somebody I admired or appreciated from afar as a fan, you know, as uh, someone who enjoyed their work on screen or on stage, whatever the case might be. But I'm a nobody. I'm nobody special. I highly doubt for a moment if you ask Matthew Broderick, do you remember this guy knocking you on your way? He might remember that. If you were to ask some of these others, do you, do, do you remember this fella? You know, you talked to him for a while. Even Danny uh, Bonaducci. I, you know, I had a chance to sit and talk with him at least two or three different times. I can't quite remember which, but I, I remember two expressly. I, you know, he probably talks so many people, he no more thinks about me than he thinks about anything. I remember my meeting with him. Well, I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of people in church today remember the day they met Jesus, but Jesus will never remember the day he met them. Mm. Oh, my God, have mercy. Yeah, but uh, does he know you? I know Jesus. We got people running all over the country making fools out of themselves in the name of the Lord. I know God. I know the Lord. I know Jesus. That's all well and good, but does Jesus know you? Because when it comes time to get your entry into heaven, honey, your knowing him will carry no weight. 
His knowing you will carry all the weight. Hello now. He said the day's going to come when the door is going to be shut up and people will be painting on the door. Lord, Lord, I know you. I know you. You and I have eaten together. You and I have spent time together. I'll never forget the day. Hallelujah. I went down to the altar of that little church and prayed the sinner's prayer because the preacher told me that's all I had to do to be saved. I'll never forget it, Lord. The Lord looks through the little window in the door and says, Sorry, buddy, I haven't got a clue who you are. You don't look even the least bit familiar to me. But does he know you? In Job chapter 1 and verse 8, listen to the Lord bragging to Satan about Job. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil. Oh, what do you know? We don't have Job talking about knowing God. We have God talking about knowing Job. Hello now. Oh, I want to tell you today. <laughs> I, I don't care how much I can tell people about my knowledge of God. I don't care how much ability I may have to lead people to Jesus and introduce them to the Lord. I just hope and pray today that He knows me. I just hope and pray today that as God looks down upon planet earth, he sees in me somebody he can brag on, somebody he's proud of, somebody that he would even be willing to sit in front of the devil and say, you know what devil, here's a guy that is so committed to me and so in love with me and so faithful to me that there's not a thing in this world you could throw at him that would cause him him to falter or fail. Sometimes people get upset when they're going through trials and tribulations. Sometimes we get upset when God seems to allow us to experience things we'd rather not experience. We're in a job we'd rather not have. We're in a city we'd rather not live in. We're doing a work for God that doesn't seem to be going anywhere fast. Hello now. Oh, we get so upset. We get so tired. We get so frustrated. Oh, hallelujah. But what we don't realize is that we're going through that because just a few months ago, just a couple of years ago, God was bragging about you in heaven. Hallelujah. He was telling the devil, devil, let me tell you something. This guy here, this woman here, I don't care what you throw at them. They're not going to give up their faith. They're not going to give up their walk. They're not going to give up their commitment to me. And you may be going through some things today you'd rather not be going through. God knows I am. But every once in a while the Holy Ghost will kind of whisper in your ear and say, you know what? You're going through what you're going through because I've been bragging on you. Hallelujah. Oh, isn't that a wonderful thought? The Word of God said that God will not allow us to experience anything greater than we can bear. Right. So if you're going through it, there is a purpose. If you're going through it, there is a plan. If you're going through it, you may not understand it. You may not like it. You may wish things were a whole lot different. But where you are is where God wants you. And you're going through what you're going through because God is doing something in your life. He's sharpening your pencil. He is sharpening the axe head. He's doing something. And honey, it is iron that sharpens iron. If 
you're going to get any better today than you were yesterday, if you're going to be any better tomorrow than you were today, then it ain't softness and sweetness and good things that sharpens you. It's going through the tough times and the difficult times. It's going through periods when your faith is trampled and tested. It's going through periods of experiences you'd so much rather not go through. That's what sharpens us. That's what makes us ready. Lord said, I'm sure in the back of God's mind, the Bible said God knows the end from the beginning. I'm sure in the back of his mind, he thought, you know what I've done, given the devil permission to take everything Job's got. But what the old stupid devil doesn't know is I've got a plan to give to Job twice everything he's got. He's going to, oh, hallelujah, he's going to wind up with so much more when this thing is over. Because iron sharpens iron, hallelujah. He's going to wind up with so much more than he ever started with. And you know what? Job's got the faith to trust me. Job's got the faith to believe me. His wife didn't. His wife shouted out to her husband, Why don't you just curse God and die? And Job looked at her and said, Oh, honey, <laughs> the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> Talk about worshiping God anyhow. Talk about giving the Lord praise in every circumstance, in every situation. Job, even his wife, wasn't going to bring him down. He was committed to his faith. He was committed to his walk with God. Oh, but does he know you? He knew Job. What have we done in our lives and in our Christian walk to draw the Lord's attention to us? What do we do that brings His admiration and causes Him to brag on us? The same things that bring us to the Lord's attention, listen to me now, also brings us to the enemy's attention. <laughs> oh, when the devil notices, excuse me, when God notices you, you better believe the devil notices you too. Because the same things that impress God make the devil mad. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy. So if you're running around saying, oh, the devil must be mad at me. I feel the fire on my feet. I feel him turning up the heat in my life. Well, then you ought to praise God because the same thing gets the devil's attention gets God's attention. Whatever it is that made the devil mad made God glad. Hallelujah to God. So you can rejoice today in the knowledge that you likely have. God's attention. Oh, my word, have mercy. Wow. But what have we done as believers to draw the Lord's attention? In Acts chapter 19 and verse 15, the sons of Sceva were trying to cast demons out of a man, and the demons responded to them Using the name of Jesus. See, they knew Jesus, but they also knew Jesus didn't have a clue who these boys were. Mm -hmm. The demons responded, Acts 19, 15, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. Mm -hmm. But who are ye? So you hadn't done nothing to get our attention. I got news for you, honey. If you hadn't gotten our attention, you hadn't gotten God's attention either. Because the same thing makes him glad, makes us mad. So if I don't know you, then there's a good chance the Lord hadn't got a clue who you are either. Got news for you, folks. According to the words of Jesus in our primary text today, there are going to be many, not a few, not quite a few, many, he said who are going to be wanting in on the kingdom of God, but ultimately they will not make it. And they will not make it for one simple reason, and that reason is they are not known by the Lord. They can know Him all they want to. Oh, we've partied with you. We've had dinner with you. We've attended the same meetings 
place you've been in. Why, Lord, I used to go to the United Pentecostal Church. I went to camp meeting. I went to conferences. I went to because of the times. I was always in your presence. Where are you now? Huh. Because not once did you do a single stinking thing that made me look your way. But Lord, you don't understand. These queers came to my wife's bakery and they wanted her to bake a cake for their wedding. And oh, oh, oh we stood tall and firm and we were committed. Glory to God. We don't support that garbage. So we weren't about to bake a cake, Lord. Didn't you notice me doing that? No. Can't say it's I did. See, uh, I notice one thing and one thing only. I notice when people do right. Mm -hmm. I've taught you not to judge and sit in judgment. I've taught you to show love to everybody, especially those who are outside of the family of God, especially to those that are outside the church. Do you think your actions for one minute spoke to those people and made them the least bit hungry for God or made them even the least bit interested in walking in relationship with me. Do you think your behavior did that? Because got news for you, it didn't. I know the end from the beginning. I know how it turned out. See, I'm not sitting here trying to guess. I know. I saw it. I was there. I wasn't impressed by your jackassery. I wasn't impressed by your foolishness. I wasn't impressed by your stupidity. What would have impressed me is if you'd have loved those people in spite of any disagreement you may have had. If you'd have baked them the best cake you could bake and said to them, I hope you all enjoyed this cake. Didn't ask you to endorse what they were doing. I asked you, all they asked you to do was bake them a cake. It's none of your stinking beeswax what they do with that cake. If they want to lay naked in that cake and roll around at an orgy, that is their prerogative. It is none of your business what they're doing with the cake or what the cake uh, is helping them to celebrate. If they hired you to bake a cake, then as a child of God, you should have lovingly baked them a cake. Right. Wished them well and sent them on their way. So no, I wasn't impressed because see, the things you think I ought to take notice of, I don't care about. And the things I do care about, you don't. So when you stand outside the kingdom of heaven's door banging, telling the Lord about how much you knew him and how much you did in his name, I've got news for you today, children. The question is going to be, but does he know you? Religion is of little use to the Lord. He is not impressed by theological learning or spiritual knowledge. God desires relationship, not religion. The closer we grow in relationship to him, the more we will act and behave like him. This is what draws his gaze and causes him to better know us. Mm -hmm. In Psalm 34, verse 15, the word of God reads, The eyes of the Lord, listen, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Where is God looking? What makes God look one way or the other when people are doing right? Yes. My Lord, have mercy. Not when they're practicing their religion. Mm -hmm. Not when they're bragging about their learning or their expertise or their theological understanding or the depths of their knowledge. In Genesis 6, 5 through 8, the Word of God declares, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination 
of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord, meaning the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. Verse number 8, Genesis 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> oh, do you know Jesus? Mm -hmm. But better than that, he knows me. See, Noah didn't have to go looking for the Lord. The Lord saw Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah didn't even know what was going to happen. Noah didn't ask for mercy. Noah didn't ask for grace. Noah didn't repent of anything. Hello now. No. God came to Noah and extended to him the knowledge of the forthcoming flood and gave him an opportunity to be used of God to preserve not only humankind on the face of the planet, but also animal kind on the face because he was going to destroy all of it. That's why I tell you what the Word of God said, for God so loved the world that He gave us only. I got news for you, honey. That don't just mean mankind. That means the world. That means the planet. That means the whole of His creation. God did more for this old planet at Calvary than we'll ever know. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, what have you done to draw the Lord's gaze? What do you do that causes the Lord to look at your way, to brag about you, to find pride in your conduct and in the way you live your life as a child of God? In Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, verses 1 and 2, I should say, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now listen to this next phrase, Acts 10. Verse 2, about halfway through. The Lord came to, excuse me, it's, it's not in the passage, this is my statement. The Lord came to Cornelius. Cornelius did not find the Lord. Oh my goodness. The Lord got word to Cornelius, hey, there's somebody I think you need to talk to. His name is Peter, and here's where he's staying. Send you some men over there. Get hold of him. Have him come and fill you in on what I'm talking about. Do you understand what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you something, honey. When God, <laughs> when you've done something to grab God's attention, when you've done something that causes God to look your way, when you've done something that causes the Lord to know who you are, are. now you're in good standing now you're in a good place nobody can say to Cornelius did you find Jesus no nope. Cornelius if he were if he were honest if he were truthful he'd have to answer no nope, never did he found me <laughs> hallelujah I never found the Lord but he found me and you know, all I was was sincere in my faith. All I was was sincere in the desire to know God. All I did was act in compassion toward those that were in need and gave alms liberally. All I did was seek after God with all my heart. I prayed continually. 
Bible said if we would come to God, we must first believe that He is, and secondly, that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You want to get God's attention, diligently seek Him. I get tired of Christians who the only time they spend trying to learn about God or trying to deepen their walk with the Lord or trying to have an experience with God that grows deeper and better than it is uh, today is when they come into the house of God. No, you want to get God's attention. You want to make sure He knows who you are. Be one of them crazy people like this old preacher I know who's constantly praying and seeking God even when he's driving his car. Even when he's going up to Oklahoma, he's worshiping and praising God and talking to the Lord. Because I don't need church. I don't need a certain con, uh, 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 confine in order for me to be able to uh, get something and draw nearer to the Lord. No. So you want to get God's attention? You must believe that He is and that He is rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Start, start doing some due diligence and looking for Him sincerely. Look for Him. Look for fellowship with Him. Look for communion with Him. Look for the Holy Ghost to come down and bless you and touch you. Oh, every once in a while when I'm in church, Pastor, I'll tell you what, whoo, I get the feeling, the goosebumps, and I feel so good. I mean, to take, got news for you, honey, there's more where that came from, and you don't have to be in church to get it. You want to get God's attention? Why don't you go hunting for it when you're at home? Why don't you go hunting for it when you're driving your car? Why don't you go hunting for it when it isn't, quote, the appointed time for church service? See if God isn't a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Oh, I know God, but more importantly, does He know you? James chapter 1 verse 27. The word of the Lord declares, Pure religion, pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this. You want to know how God looks at religion? Well, here it is. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Always cracks me up how holiness folk and Pentecostal folk, you start talking about keeping yourself unspotted from the world and these jackals will immediately go to hair, makeup, and jewelry. It's all about how you dress and how you look. It's all about, oh, we keep ourselves separate from the world and the way we look. You sure do, but your spirit stinks. Mm -hmm. Your attitude stink. Your thought processes stink. Because all of those things are identical to the attitudes and the thought processes and the spirit you find in the world. I don't need my taxes paying for somebody else to get health care. I don't need my taxes going to help somebody else get an education. I don't need my tax. Do you know what? If you're dumb fool enough to believe that attitude is a Christ-like, biblical, scriptural attitude, you are a moron. Mm -hmm. You, There's something wrong with you. you. You make dumb people look smart. You really do. You make dumb people look brilliant. Folks, i got news for you. The church is full of people today who are anything but unspotted from the world. Anything but. Don't tell me how long your hair is, lady. Don't tell me how long you wear your dresses or that you never put on open-toed shoes. Mister, don't tell me how you shave your face clean every morning and you wear your hair above the ear and off the collar and you don't ever put on blue jeans and you don't ever wear sneakers. Bless God, you're always clean cut. You're always the perfect example of what a Christ-like man ought to be. Bony! Baloney. Because your spirit stinks, your attitude stinks, your motivations stink, the way you think stinks. 
Why do you think the word of God said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because not everybody calls himself a Christian, thinks like Christ. That's right. But we're supposed to. The only way to act more like Jesus is to draw closer to Jesus. Immediately after sharing the parable, we've all heard the parable of the unprofitable servant. Some would refer to, re refer to it as the parable of the talents. It was immediately after sharing the parable of the talents that Jesus spoke this. In Matthew 25 verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, an immigrant. Someone, a refugee. And ye took me in. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison. And ye came unto me. <clears throat> then shall the righteous answer him. Wait a minute. What, 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 what did the word of God just tell us? I'll tell you what it just told us. It told us that people who do these sorts of things are doing right. Because people who do these sort of things then are identified as what? The righteous. So you want to know, the Bible said the eyes of the Lord are upon the who? Righteous. Who are the righteous? People who do these sorts of things. What do they do? They feed the hungry. They, they give water to those who are thirsty. They help to clothe those who are naked. They visit those who are sick and in prison. Hello now. Oh, the word of God is not ambiguous as to how righteousness is defined, folks. You want to get the Lord's attention? You want Him to look your way? You can stand all you want to on the issue of abortion. You can go and you can tick, uh, pick at as many abortion clinics as you want to. Got news for you. God ain't looking there. Then shall the righteous, verse 37, answer Him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, in so much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison. And he visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, in so much as ye did it not, to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life 
eternal. Yeah, don't tell me that heaven ain't real and hell ain't hot. Don't tell me hell's not real. The Word of God tells us as plain as it can say it that punishment for the wicked is everlasting. Mm -hmm. The true purpose found in and the lesson to be learned from the parable of talents is this. If we know the Lord as we ought, we should know what He expects of us without His even having to specifically lay it out before us in terms of what He exactly desires and requires. The emphasis being on relationship. With a well-developed relationship comes deeper understanding of the Master's nature and of the Master's will. When you read the story of the talents, you see the unprofitable servant coming up and giving the Lord back exactly what God gave him. Nothing had changed. There's a lot of Christians from the minute they prayed at the altar and claimed to become a born-again child of God in the moment Jesus comes. Ain't nothing changed. Nothing's changed in their life. Everything's the same. They still got the same bad spirit they had. They still got the same bad attitudes they had. They still got the worldly mindset they always had. They still got the carnal thinking they always had. Nothing's changed. But what is the real lesson to be found in the talents? It's very simple. And I think most of the time the church completely glosses or we're so busy talking about talents. If you can sing, you ought to use it for the Lord. If you can play, you, come on people, let's grow up. Let, let's, let's grow up for God's sakes. What is the real lesson? The Lord said to his servant, what? If you had known me. You would have known that I reaped where I did not straw. Isn't that what he said? You would have known how I operate. You would have known how I think. And based on that, you would have done things the way I would expect you to do it. But the fact is, you didn't do any of that. Why? Because you claimed to know me, but you didn't know me at all. The minute I got back, first thing you said to me is, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. No, you didn't know me at all. Because the Lord said, if you had known me, then you should have done things differently. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And immediately after that parable, Jesus goes into this talk about the righteous behaving righteously and being welcomed into the kingdom of heaven and the unrighteous not behaving righteously and being cast out into everlasting punishment. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? What was the Lord really trying to say? He was really trying to say, if you know anything about me at all, then you'll understand this is how I expect you to behave. If you want a return on your investment, if you want to get back more than you put in, then this is how I expect you to conduct yourself. I'm trying to hurry. Matthew 22, 35 through 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 7, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. 
for this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Huh, is, does that sound familiar? Did you not read that today in our primary text? Did you not read the Lord encouraging His people to come in via the straight gate? Mm -hmm. In Luke 13, verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. In Matthew 7, He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Notice how in this passage the Lord speaks of the narrow way, and the straight gate. He's speaking about his desire that we treat others in the manner that we would wish to be treated. What makes the path so narrow for those who would be saved? It is the proactive and purposeful way in which we are called to live. We're not called to live reactionary and emotional lives, but purposeful and predetermined lives. Our primary text began today with the phrase, Luke 13, 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Believers have a code we live by, and this code is embedded within our soul. It is not something we must contemplate or consider. It is so much a part of us that we immediately and without thought or reservation apply it to every decision we make. In a nutshell, Tommy, treat others well. Mm -hmm. This is not the natural way of man. Selfishness and self-serving is our default. Mm -hmm. Treating others well is not the way of the world, for it requires that we see people and circumstances through the eyes of love and compassion. Love is of God, and only those who embrace love and who seek to operate from a place of compassion and empathy can therefore demonstrate true love. Lastly, this afternoon, while you brag about knowing the Lord, I ask you the question, but does He know you? Mm -hmm. What have you done that's drawn His attention? What have you done that causes you to stand out from the crowd so that He knows your name? Galatians 6, 7-10 through 10, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. How do we sow to the Spirit? It's easy. We sow to the Spirit by doing those things which Jesus has identified as right mm -hmm. and righteous. When we feed the poor, when we help those who are struggling, when we take in the stranger, when we act in this fashion, when we behave in love and compassion, when we treat others as we would like to be treated, when we do these things, we are sowing to the Spirit. Verse number 9, Galatians 6. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Let me repeat that in closing. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. 
especially those who are of the household of faith. It's all well and good to brag about knowing the Lord. It's all well and good to stand on your religious convictions and brag about your spiritual knowledge and learning. But honey, my question for you today is simply this. Does he know you? Amen. Just stand with me this afternoon. Praise God.